Welcome to Channel 18 News. I'm Jim Rogers. A man wanted on a homicide warrant in Dallas County was apprehended Monday evening on Interstate 30 at the 140 mile marker. Silver Springs Police Officer Cleve Williams made a traffic stop. Juan Alberto Batista, age 17, of Memphis, Tennessee, was found to have a warrant for his arrest. Batista is in Hopkins County Jail, held without bond for Dallas County authorities. Responding to a welfare concern, Silver Springs Police found Kyle Dean Fargo, age 37, of Gage, Oklahoma, standing outside a Freightliner truck at a local travel center. Fargo seemed to be under the influence of a narcotic, and the police officer had received word that Fargo might have methamphetamine in his possession. Although Fargo refused consent to search the vehicle, a canine assisted with the search and a possible alert on the vehicle was made. The subsequent search found a pill bottle with less than one gram of methamphetamine. Fargo is in Hopkins County Jail, charged with possession of a controlled substance penalty group 1, less than one gram, a state jail felony. Following a special crimes unit investigation into the sale of methamphetamine, Curtis Leroy Marler, age 47, of Emory, was arrested on two charges of manufactured delivery of a controlled substance. Two separate undercover buys resulted in approximately 7.4 grams of methamphetamine being purchased. Marler is in Hopkins County Jail, charged with manufactured delivery control substance penalty group 1, more than 4 grams but less than 200 grams in a drug-free zone, a felony 1, and manufactured delivery of a control substance penalty group 1, more than 1 gram but less than 4 grams in a drug-free zone, a felony 2. Hopkins County could benefit from a declaration made by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. The announcement was made Monday. FEMA announced that federal disaster assistance has been made available to the state of Texas to supplement state and local recovery efforts in the areas affected by severe storms and flooding in September 10th to November 12th, or excuse me, November 2nd of 2018. Hopkins County is one of 33 counties included in the disaster assistance. The assistance will be on a cost share basis for hazard mitigation measures. The cost sharing will be for emergency work and repair or replacement of facilities damaged by storms and flooding. Hopkins County Judge Robert Newsom said Tuesday morning that Hopkins County has an opportunity once again to benefit from the disaster declaration through the FEMA proclamation. In behalf of the citizens of the county who live on county roads, he said they hope to apply for approximately $500,000 in damages which resulted from the October flooding event. In addition, this declaration opens the door for potential mitigation projects on the roads and other emergency needs. Newsom said, we are thankful that the state of Texas has been approved for relief. We'll begin the process in March and hope to be working on the affected areas of our county before summer. Candidates for the Silver Springs City Council municipal race May 4th drew for ballot place on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Candidates order for place four on the ballot. Incumbent Freddie Taylor will be listed first. Rico Alexander will be listed second. Candidates for order on place five will include the challenger Jeff Sanderson first, the incumbent Emily Glass second. The candidate order for place six on the ballot, Doug Moore, who was appointed to the office, will be placed first, and Landon Thornton will be second. Tuesday morning at the Silver Springs Country Club, the Gillis Foundation made grant presentations to three county schools. It was a great day. It took us a long time to get here. <laughs> We're finally going to give out some money. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all something. When you first, you know, we've been thinking about this for a very long time, right? And Debbie and I are committed to, to all levels of education. And uh, we've been very fortunate in our lives. We want to share some of that good fortune with the local community. And so you start down that road and you see some roadblocks. Well, the first thing you see is you, you can't just go hand money to everybody. You've got to, you've got to qualify for the IRS, first of all. <laughs> yeah. Then once you get the idea to get the money out and how you want to do it, obviously there are things you have to do. I mean, I, I'm not obviously to me, but I'm brand new to this. But Robin has taught us along the way all the regulations that are required and, and uh, the, the uh, steps you have to fulfill to make sure that you do it legitimately and so that everybody gets a fair shot at it. 
And, um, and so we just had to formulate the overall plan. Of course, uh, as we started, we evolved, starting out just thinking about all kinds of different things, but we came to the conclusion of doing classroom grants every year as one half of our program, the other half of our program being 10 scholarships for the Hopkins County students every year. Well, this is the classroom grant portion that we're finally getting to. And we have the commitment to give $100,000 a year to Hopkins County School Districts. And uh, over the course of the next 10 years, that's going to be a million dollars. And we, we feel like that's going to be substantial uh, for our community. We all know the debate in Austin's going on right now about uh, how to fund schools, and they're probably going to change the rules around. Who knows what's going to happen there? It's never permanent. <laughs> they get one thing done one session, then they come back and change it to the next. This is permanent. We can count on this. I can promise y'all. This is money that's going to be coming every year. And so as you formulate your plans for these grants, let me say much I appreciate the grants that were submitted, this, uh, applications that were submitted this year. Just keep in mind, it's coming every year. And so if you've got some ideas, you get something you want to do, just make sure you keep it coming. Because this, this money will be there. It'll be available. It's something you can always count on. The second half of this is going to be our scholarship uh, uh, coming very soon. Uh, we're going to announce 10 scholarships, uh, the four-year scholarships uh, for the tuition that are available in our local or community school areas. And we're excited about getting that done. <laughs> I guess the hardest part is getting the first piece of it done. And that's what we're doing here today. Once you really get it on the ground, everybody understands you're serious about it. Maybe they'll stand up and say, wait. Well, I think we want to take part in that, right? And so, <laughs> and so especially our scholarship uh, applicants, we want as many as possible. And uh, Rob can explain this better than I can. We're looking for talent that doesn't, it's not coming from families that have the ability just to send their kids to UT or Texas. We want kids that are maybe first generation going to school, change the dynamic of the family and the, and the community. And so uh, it's, a, it's a small start, but very, very proud to be here. So I was, I was um, as you know, right now we're in, we're in session. Um, so when I'm not out in the district covering my counties, I'm sitting at my desk doing emails, we're doing casework. But I always have this session going on and watching all the committees. And I don't know if y'all watch, uh, but yeah. yesterday, I think it was three or four hours on this committee on finance, specifically talking about schools. Right. Some of the stuff you kind of touched on. Um, and, and races for teachers. There's a lot of other issues, a lot of, a lot of other concerns um, other than just teachers. But I think this is a good solution for right now, and I'm sure in the future we're gonna work on other solutions. And s schools are, are high on the priority for Senator Bob Hall. Um, number one, and I've heard him say this a million times, our priority is the teachers and the students. Number one, teachers and students. Okay, that's that's what that's where we need to focus. Um, where where extra money is going and taking care of those folks. Um, so, I just got some certificates for Como Picton. possible 32 points using a rubric score, um, the top three were less than two points uh, off a piece. That's how, how close it was. Um, and so we were able to fully fund um, one grant applicant, um, two and three, because it didn't add up to $100,000, we had to go back and negotiate with them a little bit. And, and lower um, what they requested, but they didn't turn down the offer. They were very <laughs> gracious about that. Um, and so, um, as Johnny mentioned earlier, this is an annual thing. This is not a one-time. Uh, what we did um, ask them to do is to spread the funding over three years. One of the things that we have found is that a one-year pot of money doesn't make the impact 
that a, a true three-year strategic plan will make. We also ask them to um, describe how they were going to sustain this beyond the life of the grant or the funding. What we did want to see was a program or an initiative start, but then not continue if the funding did not continue. Um, but as Johnny also said, this is $100,000 that will be um, given away every year. And so we just encourage all of you to continue to apply as long as it um, matches our mission and they all did beautifully and that is to ensure that our high school graduates in Hopkins County are both college and career ready. That being that they um, have the academic strength to go on to college, um, but they also have the soft skills uh, that they learned through their work as students um, to be good employees. Um, because what corporate America is telling us is that they're getting bright new hires, but they can't think themselves out of the box. And we need innovative, problem-solving, team-working folks um, in small business as well as in corporate America. A huge piece of their money is not only curriculum, but training for their teachers and how their teachers are going to design student work differently that reflects those high cognitive level thinking, problem-solving, and, and processing, uh, being analytical um, the situations and so they really want to focus on the classroom with first their teachers. I, I always said teachers learn first, students learn second. And so they really put a, a lot of money into their staff as well as the curriculum. Dr. Bauer, is there anything, or Janet, is there anything you would like to add to that? Oh. <laughs> so, um, if the three of you would like to come up, we have a, a presentation.
And last but not least, um, the Sulphur Bluff Independent School District. And Sulphur Bluff applied for uh, monies to increase the quality of technology that was in the hands of their students. And not only the technology, but how they use the technology. That it won't, won't be used just as an old typewriter, as we say. That they actually use it to problem solve, to do research. Um, it's what we call blended learning, um, which is uh, where students um, take information, but then do something with it and take it to a whole other level that they could not do without these devices in their hands. Sulphur Bluff also put a lot of their funding and their money into their staff and uh, professional development and ensuring that the teachers felt very comfortable with their students sitting with um, these handheld devices, uh, this technology, handheld computers, if you will, that they felt comfortable in designing work and delivering lessons at a level that was truly going to change the life of the students and how they processed information, access information, and what they did uh, with that information. Dr. Carmen, you would add anything to that? Amy, Ms. Daniel, you would add anything to that? Just thank you for the investment in the kids and, and what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it, it just makes a huge impact on such small schools like we are in, rural, in the rural area. So, uh, you know, that kind of investment uh, just makes a, makes a big difference for, for our students. Yes, yes. So, well, congratulations come on up. Here's Don Judian with sports. First in the news, the Sulphur Springs High School Wildcat UIL academic team hosted the Judy Tipping Memorial UIL academic meet this past Friday and Saturday. And as a team, the Wildcat UILers finished second overall to Hallsville High School. And the following students and teams uh, brought home awards in their events. And we'll start with Ready Riding where Matthew Harper took first place, Bracken Sant was third, and uh, Laney Whittle uh, took fifth place. In computer science, Braden Fisher was first place, uh, Blake Talmadge third place, Dakota Souls fifth place, Kevin Orozco was sixth place, and the team of Fisher, Souls, and Orozco was a second place team. In current events, Brandon Hodges uh, took first place, and the team of Hodges and James Draper and also Weston Vosquez uh, was a second-place team. Spelling and vocabulary, Cameron Baird took second place. In news writing, Mariana Botello took first place. Literary criticism, Matthew Harper took first place, Carissa Carter was second place, Laney Whittle was third place, and the team of Harper, Carter, Whittle, and Botello was a first place team. In social studies, Brandon Hodges took second place. In poetry, Emily Gotcher took second place, and Allie Grace Woodard uh, took third place. In prose, Rachel Bramlett, first place, and Hannah Schultz, sixth place. In LD Debate, Corbin Philo took first place and Rhett Reed took fifth place. 
and the uh, Wildcat speech team was a first place team. In number sense, Kendall Little took sixth place overall and third place in the 10th grade, and Isaac Gutierrez took fourth place in the 11th grade. In calculator, Carissa Carter took fourth place in 12th grade, Isaac Gutierrez was fifth place in 11th grade, and Kennedy Lee took sixth place in 11th grade. Mathematics, Ivory Lou took fourth place in the 11th grade, uh, Kennedy Lee sixth place in the 11th grade, and Kendall Little was fifth place in the 10th grade. And finally in science, Matthew Harper took uh, fifth place in the 10th grade. And now in sports, the Wildcats baseball team used good starting pitching and 10 base hits to defeat North Lamar 10-4 at Wildcat Park in the regular season home opener on Monday night. The Wildcats also benefited from four walks, four hit batters, and two Panther errors. Payson Edwards got the pitching win for the Wildcats, allowing no runs and only two hits over four innings. Edwards also walked four and struck out five. The Wildcats backed Edwards with a six-run first inning. The Panthers allowed a fly ball to fall in for a hit during the big inning. Cameron Harrison also had an RBI when he was hit by a pitch with the bases loaded. Connor Bergen had the biggest hit in that first inning, a bloop single that drove in two runs. The Wildcats made it an 8 to nothing game with two runs in the second inning. Jace Thompson drove a run home with a single, and Harrison got an RBI on a fielder's choice. Then, in the third inning, the Wildcats went up 9 nothing as Bergen scored from third on a wild pitch. The Panthers rallied back for three runs in the top of the fifth inning. The Wildcats scored their 10th run in the bottom of the 6th. Edwards uh, drove home a run with a single. North Lamar scored a 4th run in the top of the 7th. Austin Dodd, Edwards, and Harrison all had two hits for the Wildcats. The Wildcats improved to 4-1 and one for the season, and they'll play in a van tournament this Thursday through Saturday. And Wildcats golf coach, or make that Lady Cats golf coach, Whitney Spigner, said her Lady Cats had a rough day Monday at a tournament at Hideaway Lake Golf Course in Lindale. She said that was due to a lack of practice time due to the weather. She said there's only so much you can do indoors where you can't see where the ball goes after you hit it, and hitting off mats is nothing like hitting off the ground that is wet and muddy. She did say Hideaway Lake's course was in pretty good shape Monday considering all of the recent rainfall. Coach Spigner said the low round Monday was only 83. For the Lady Cats, Miriam Tran shot 92, Addison White had 110, and Charlie Potts shot 113. Coach Spigner said the tournament used a triple bogey limit. She said the district golf tournament is still about five weeks away. Next Tuesday, the Lady Cats return to Lindale to play in a tournament at Garden Valley. Thanks for watching Channel 18 News. Have a great evening.